So the lectures that are called the Foundations of Human Experience, which were previously published as Study of Man, um, were given in August 1919, just before the first uh, Waldorf School opened in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, the school grew out of the impulse of Emil Molt, who was the manager of the Waldorf Astoria Cigarette Factory, who initially wanted to open a school for the children of the factory employees. The school quickly grew to uh, roughly a thousand students, only maybe 15 or 20 percent of whom were actual children of factory employees. It was very popular at the time. So this is 1919, the summer of 1919. Uh, one year after the end of the First World War, which was called the War to End All Wars, or the Great War. And Emil Molt and Rudolf Steiner and many other people wanted to intervene in the world in a way that would make it a more peaceful and just place. And this intervention through education was one of several attempts. Another attempt was Rudolf Steiner's publication of the book that's known as Towards Social Renewal, um, which was written, not transcribed from lectures, and lays out a vision of social structure uh, based on what's called a threefold organism, uh, a sort of separate administrations for cultural life, economic life, and between them, life of rights and responsibilities, sometimes including uh, politics and aspects of the legal system. And so the Waldorf School in Stuttgart fits into Steiner's view of a free or independent cultural life, which is to say one not uh, governed by or the state. Of course, all schools are regulated by the state in the sense that they have to provide safe buildings and um, meet fire codes and in other ways um, uh, pr protect the students that are there. So there is a life of rights and responsibilities among students, teachers, parents, community members, and so on. But in terms of carrying out the educational aims of the school, that was intended to be, as much as possible in Germany in 1919, um, completely in the hands of the teachers of the school. So it's free of political influence and even free of economic influence. So the lectures that are collected in the Foundations of Human Experience were a course that Rudolf Steiner gave each morning for 14 days. Um, they were supplemented later in the day by another series of lectures called Practical Advice to Teachers and then followed up in the late afternoon with uh, discussions with the teachers that are also transcribed and recorded. So those three volumes together constitute the first course for the first teachers at the first Waldorf School. And these lectures, Foundations of Human Experience, really represent, um, you could say, the core or heart or center of Rudolf Steiner's educational work. His view was pretty clear that part of the failure of the world that led to the First World War and unfortunately the Second World War, the Cold War, and much that we've experienced since was due to an education system that did not acknowledge the full reality of the students within it. And so if I could summarize that briefly, what I would say is that um, we have created, uh, even still in 2016, enjoy uh, to some extent an education system that acknowledges science as truthful but me ultimately meaningless and the humanities as pursuing meaning but ultimately without any genuine truth in a scientific sense. And so I think Steiner's project, as challenging as it was and really still is, is to overcome that that great schism or divide between the humanities on one hand and the sciences on the other. And in fact, in German, uh, the sciences are called Naturwissenschaft and the spiritual sciences or humanities are called Geisteswissenschaft. And so Steiner's project was really to bring about uh, a, an elevation of the humanities or the spiritual sciences to the point where they could reintegrate healthfully with what we enjoy of genuine science um, and sort of heal heal the division between those two two realms of human knowledge and human experience and in order to do that of course in order to educate a child or a human being it's it's critical in fact it's necessary to have a view of what it is we mean by a human being and i think these lectures are really steiner's deepest attempt 
to say what a human being truly is in body, in soul, and in spirit. Um, when I talk about them and think about them, uh, sometimes I encounter people who we will immediately want to argue about whether a soul exists or not or whether soul and spirit mean the same thing and so on. With these lectures, I don't think that's a very fruitful conversation. It's more important, I believe, to read them and to find and then try to understand Steiner's very clear distinctions between spirit and soul, what he means by spirit and what he means by soul, um, and to understand them on his own terms on the one hand and then in modern terms, on the other hand, which I think we, a uh, hundred years later or so, can really do in a, in, a, in a fairly clear and almost profound way. The book Foundations of Human Experience really examines Steiner's distinctions among the concepts of body, soul, and spirit. Uh, these obviously are integrated into one complete human being, but for Steiner, they also exist as identifiable portions, I don't even really want to say parts because they're not like Lego where you can take one out and put it back, um, portions of human existence and human experience. The soul in a way is the easiest to understand immediately and it finds its root in the conventional word psychology because the Greek word psyche can almost be translated as soul uh, in a particular way. The goddess psyche represents the soul, you could say. Um, for Steiner, the soul is, at least at first, that part of us that engages in thinking, in experiencing emotions or feelings, some of which we have control over and some of which we may not, and then acting in the world or exerting our will in the world. And in Steiner's view, the relationship among these three, thinking, feeling, and will, which um, some psychologists I know would call them cognition, affect, and behavior, um, is, a, is, a, is an interesting one and it's kind of instructive. So he sees thinking as uh, a, a kind of distancing from the world. He often uses the word antipathy to describe it. I'm not crazy about the word antipathy for English speakers because it has a negative connotation and I don't think Steiner means that. I think he simply means that in order to think about something, you necessarily have to distance yourself from it. Whereas in sympathy, which has a more positive connotation, you seek to unite yourself with something. And so if I pick up an ax to split wood, I'm literally uh, engaged in activity in the world. I, have, I, as a human being, am having an effect on the world. The wood is splitting, the ax is getting warm in my hands, and so on. And so there's a, a kind of completely sympathetic engagement in, in, in the activity that human beings perform in the world. And between these two, between uh, sympathetic engagement and an antipathetic or distancing, thoughtful approach to the world, lies the realm of feeling or emotion. For Steiner, all thinking contains an element of will, an intention, let's say, uh, or, a, or an activity of mind, and an element of feeling. Without interest, we wouldn't pursue a thought. Uh, and similarly, will involves always a little bit of thinking. That's where the word intention actually belongs, pardon me. Uh, will always involves at least the, the, the conscious intention of thinking um, and also the resolution of feeling, the feeling that we're going to do something and then carry it out. And so these three, thinking, feeling, and will, are intimately related will representing a kind of sympathetic engagement with the world, thinking representing a kind of antipathetic or distancing relationship with the world, and then feeling, holding the balance in the middle, uniting them always and necessarily. And so for Steiner, that unity of thinking, feeling, and will uh, represents what he means when he uses the, the word uh, soul to describe the human soul. So Steiner spends a good deal of the first part of the, uh, excuse me, I'll start again. Steiner spends, I was going to say knowledge of higher worlds, which is the wrong book and the wrong concept. <laughs> yeah. Steiner spends a good part of the, a good part of the first part of the lectures in Foundations of Human Experience uh, discussing in even more detail than I've just laid it out, his concept of the human soul. And from there, he moves on to discussing what he means by spirit, at least initially. Anyone who's read lots of Steiner books will recognize that 
that, that what I have to say here, and even what he has to say in this book, is an introduction to a topic that is actually far deeper and more profound. But initially, at least, Steiner talks about spirit as consciousness. And in particular, he talks again about a sort of uh, three-in-one relationship of human existence to consciousness. And so he describes how we can be uh, fully awake, we can be completely asleep, and then we can also exist in a kind of middle, drowsy, dreamy state. And for Steiner, uh, we are generally most awake in our thinking, um, most asleep in our activity. We sort of have to um, uh, renounce thinking for a little while if we're going to uh, run a race or perform an action um, that requi requires the exertion of will. And then we are sort of uh, drowsily or dreamily aware of our emotional life. And so we can almost be spectators in our emotions as much as participants in them. So we participate in the will. Um, we participate in our emotions um, in a slightly more conscious, dreamy way. And we participate in thinking in full wakefulness. And for Steiner, those three conditions, wakefulness, dreaminess, and sleep, represent uh, states of human consciousness that for him represent at least an introduction to the human spirit. One thing I might add is that the word Steiner uses for spirit is Geist, which can also be translated as mind. Uh, mind is a less controversial term for English speakers than spirit is, um, but each term is valuable in itself and has different connotations. For Steiner, the whole human being is manifest all the time in body, in soul, and in spirit. And so I can talk briefly about how the physical body manifests the soul, for instance. So we are fairly convinced that thinking is predominantly centered in the head and that the activity of our body, especially if we're, let's say, playing basketball or chopping wood, is predominantly in our limbs. And even if we have a kind of uh, brain-centered view of things and we so somehow believe that our emotions are, are brain-centered in this day and age, we know very well that we experience them in our heart and lungs. We see someone we love and our heart rate increases and our breathing increases and so on. And so Steiner is just acknowledging that the emotional center of the human being uh, is in the chest, where, which contains our heart and lungs. And so this threefold view of a human being, head on the one end, limbs on the other, and chest in the middle, for him is an expression of the soul uh, and can also be seen as an expression of the spirit, awake in our head or asleep in our limbs and sort of uh, dreamily in between in our emotions. So in order to teach a child, you have to have an image of what a human being is. And this book lays out Steiner's view of what it means to be human. In fact, I think that would almost be a better English title, what is a human being, question mark, than Foundations of Human Experience or the old title study of man. What is a human being? For Steiner, a human being uh, is a unity that consists or can be seen of body, soul, and spirit. And if we are going to teach and teach well, um, to the extent that we appreciate and understand and come to agree with Steiner's view, we teach the whole human being. So we're not simply educating bodies. We're, simply, we're not simply um, looking at children as little pictures to be filled or little computers to be programmed or little plants to be nourished and tended. We're looking at them as full human beings consisting of body, soul, and spirit. And we're sensitive then to their consciousness, which represents or manifests their spirit, and not just to their thinking, but also to their emotional uh, engagement with the world and their activity in the world. And so Waldorf education is often uh, sort of synopsized with the expression head, heart, and hands. And these lectures, I would say, give you a much, much fuller view of what Steiner really means by what lies behind the expression head, heart, and hands.